question. Uh, I'm going to, I see we have some lead Marco in here. Field. Marco I'll uh, if you come up towards me, uh, just come up in line. We're all friends here. <laughs> um, so Night of the Demons is one of my favorite horror movies. I love this movie so much. I recommend it all the time. I think that it's so cheesy. That it's so perfect. Like its pacing is perfect. The all the makeup, all the set design, it's just right <laughs> for my flavor of horror. <laughs> you know, I'll tell you something. I was just telling somebody over there too, like when I got on this film, mm -hmm. I didn't think anybody would remember it in five years. <laughs> I thought it was destined for the trash bin. <laughs> and it has like, God, it's almost 40 years now. Yeah. And it has a strong following. Yeah. I so I am I am not only deeply moved by that, but I'm I'm Really thankful that you're all here. So thank you all so much. For coming. But you know, I, I really didn't think it would last, and I'm so blown away at the fan base and just honored. I think that for the type of horror that it represents, it's so authentic and real and timeless, and like exactly right in all like dynamics. Like it does have like multiple different components of like camp yeah but the script is also really fucking amazing the music is amazing the characters are amazing everything about it i think is like pretty fucking priceless and like i also really love the second one and like i went to catholic school for eight years so like that one speaks to me like, <laughs> and also when like her tits like grow into like hand melting like uh, situations but um so one thing that kind of struck me this last time that I watched the movie, and granted, like I've seen this movie a lot of times, um, was that I was wondering if there was kind of an ode to Night of the Living Dead with like a black like protagonist and kind of like the demons coming out at the end and being very like zombie-like. Like if that was intentional, and then I was also wondering and felt like it was like significant that she was like represented as Alice in Wonderland. <laughs> and those kind of like dynamics like working together. Honestly, as an effects guy, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> but, I, you know, honestly, I, I get the Living Dead reference, uh -huh. and it did feel intentional. Yeah. I don't know, I'd have to ask Kevin, because <laughs> yeah. Kevin, I mean, Kevin will talk about Kevin for a hundred years. Like, yeah. <laughs> but uh, I do think that was intentional. Because yeah. it really does feel intentional, right? It's it's like a nod. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I couldn't, I honestly couldn't tell you. Okay. Um, I don't know. Just to speak to like the effects, though, like I just thought that they were so amazing, and I think that one reason that I love like horror movies from this particular time is that like we aren't dealing with like CGI and like all these different things and like. The components of kind of like planning and something needing to happen in the right way the right time all these like aspects that need to be like transferred onto film and be like relatable and i know you know like the chest with like <laughs> the lipstick is like the most famous fucking scene yeah like, this is <laughs> weird lipstick trick yeah <laughs> You know, I tried to get her to do that at conventions, but she just won't do it. Yeah. <laughs> <That's awesome. laughs> um, I don't know. I guess I was just like wondering a little bit about like that scene and how you set that up and like how you went about building that and like if you had ever done anything like previous to that or if this was just. I'm scared to tell you how that was done because it might actually ruin the whole thing for you. Yeah. It was very simple. It wasn't real. Very simple. <laughs> Magic. Yeah. Now, um, so really all we did was we created a gelatin chest of Linnaeus. Mm -hmm. The already existing chest. Yeah. So we took a cast of her chest and put another chest on top of it. And just did a really nice blend in makeup so that you couldn't see the seams and she 
played it out, just like you saw. <laughs> Pushed it right in there. <laughs> well, thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Hi. <laughs> um, I know you. You know, I know. <laughs> Didn't I just see you? Oh my god. Maybe. I don't know. I don't know. You're wrong. Time flies. <laughs> um, so I'm obviously a huge fan of yours. Like I love Law of Nights in 1988. I showed all a good chunk of your films to my partner. I love Night of the Demons. You know, I grew up with my aunt Monica who like loved horror films and old body horror and she passed away. I got like quite a few of her DVDs, which are super cool. And she turns me on to like loving FX and practical effects and I know in 1988, practical effect kind of reached like an all-time sort of pinnacle before digital and CGI yeah. really came in. And I love these films for that reason because I'm huge on practical effect. I love it. It's one of my few favorite things. And so, with this being your first film, is there anything specifically you like a lesson you really learned or something you really took away from like that experience? Yes and no. I mean, being being the low man on the totem pole and being as nervous as I was because I was literally pulled into that situation. I, I, I'll give a little better backstory on it because I wasn't a, an aspiring effects artist, in my mind anyway. I was a musician. I worked for a sound studio. I, I was a very theatrical artist. I wanted to do performance art type performances with my band. And I was roommates with Steve Johnson. My guitarist was the other roommate. And it, and his brother Kevin worked with Steve. So I had two guys that had worked on Ghostbusters and you know, Big Trouble in Little China. Those were my roommates. <laughs> so, you know, a little nerve wracking. Um, I wanted to do these theatrical things with my band and I kept telling Steve, 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 like, you know, like the old fan kid, hey, hey, how, what if I do this? What if I do this? What if I do that? And how would I, how would I set this up on stage? And, and he got so interested in the stuff I was thinking about, he just one day he just said, why don't you just come make rubber monsters? <laughs> and I was like, really? <laughs> and he said, yeah. And I said, and get paid? <laughs> yeah, okay. Band was history. <laughs> I was like, see ya. <laughs> so that's really how that came about. And, and working on Night of the Demons, that was, Steve's first film away from Boss Film, and he had just started what well, became X Effects. So um, for me, it was it was just a really crazy ride because I was just literally pulled into it, and uh, he felt I had enough talent to do it. So I, I you know, for for him, I wouldn't be sitting here. That's awesome. Well, thank you. Um, thank you so much for being here tonight. And oh my God, will you stop thanking me? Thank you. <laughs> I'm here for and you. I'm so like I just have to say I'm so happy to be surrounded by fans of this movie because this has been one of my favorites too. And so I saw it when I was, you know, probably right when it came out. So I was pretty young when I saw it. Uh -huh. um, and this movie scared me. <laughs> I mean, it's still pretty creepy. It's still pretty scary, but I think. When I saw it, it was it, it had, it had an effect on me. Yeah. yeah. Well, Angela. Um, yeah. And also, some of your other movies have um, pretty much like because I just saw movie, uh, horror movies when I was a kid. Um, have you ever been scared by your own effects? Has it, have you ever created oh anything that yeah. just like gave you nightmares or years? Well, just, like, I'll tell you, oh. they they scare me in the way that oh my god, I did I could have done so much better. Oh. <laughs> That's the way that they scare oh. me. Um, one of the things, I, I was a monster kid like my whole life. My mom was an executive at Universal, so I got really early exposure to a lot of things. My family was in the business. And becoming an effects artist made me both a critic and more of my own work than anything. But, um, you know, just I would look at stuff and it kind of ruined it. I'm like, oh, that could have been done so much better. So you become, you, it, it, rather than being scared of it, you, you kind of become numb. Um, and then, you know, it's like, it, it, like my second film was Dead Heat, and I don't know how many of you have seen that. Oh. 
first things I was tasked with is, if you remember the bank robbers in the beginning, one of them accidentally blows himself up with a fucking hand grenade. What a dumbass. <laughs> so, Steve said, I want you to make his remains. So, my, re my frame of reference was plane crash victims. I had to look through hundreds of pictures of plane crash victims, and those were real, as a reference. Um, so, you have to have a really dark sense of humor and be able to eat your lunch at the same time. Mm -hmm. So, it was, it was weird. I mean, it was weird uh, because you become numb to the things you're looking at as reference, as frame of reference or whatever. But uh, you have to have a dark sense of humor to get through that. So that's kind of where I was in, with it anyway. Thank you. Hi again. Hi again. Um, so uh, you have uh, obviously worked on quite a number of uh, productions that have, you know, kind of achieved legendary status. Um, I was wondering if you have a uh, a favorite film you've worked on personally. Uh, I don't because, and, and this is this is a question I get a lot, but I can't pick a favorite because. You know, and I was very lucky to be doing effects when I was doing them because so many movies were being made. And I actually, because of working on one thing or another, I would miss other opportunities. Like I wanted to work on Lost Boys. I missed that opportunities of working on something else. But, um, you know, I, I'm so humbled at, at the fact that this many of you still love these films and that there is such a huge fan base for them. Um, I, I, I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for you guys. So, um, I can't pick a favorite only because all of them are such unique experiences and they all had different challenges and they all had different rewards and they all had different nightmares. <laughs> so, they're all very unique, but they're all, I love them all. Yeah. You know, I have, I have a love-hate relationship with them, but it's more love than hate. Thank you. How you doing? Uh, doing well. Uh, just like everyone else here, I'm a huge fan of like pretty much everything that you've done. Uh, watched all of it, Howling 4, Brad Ray, I made it, like everything. Uh, so super excited to talk to you. And uh, while I have you here, you worked on probably, to me, one of the most legendary effects of all time, which is the shunting scene. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I'm in that ugly mess. Okay, so that's, and that's what I needed to ask you about, because that is such a huge piece of effects work, and everything is, is connected. It was a really big, gooey puppet show. Yeah, so was it one, like, how many molds were there? How was it to work oh on that? Oh my god, like, <laughs> that really, that movie was really cathartic for me. Um, Screaming Mad George, first of all, very good friend of mine, absolutely insane person um, but he is a true artist and the man is as good if not better painter than Salvador Dali his work is amazing um, he, my job interview I, I, I forget who else I told that today but I told I think I told a couple people my job interview with him Typically, an effects artist, you know, we're independent contractors. We go out, we show our portfolio, and they yes or no. They say yes or no, or whatever. But my my job interview with him consisted of a lunch, talking about art, music, what my preferences were. I brought my portfolio, of course. I'm wanting to go into my portfolio. He says, "Oh, I don't need to. You start tomorrow." <laughs> when he asked me about, you know, my my art influences, it was Dolly, Geiger, Bosch. So. I have a love for all things surreal. That was the end of it for him. He knew I needed to be on that project. So that was how I got hired with George. Um, and, you know, Yuzna, Brian gave him a lot of creative freedom in that film. That film was originally a blood cult film. And the script was changed. Uh, he, I remember Brian coming into the shop and George had this, it was just a Halloween mask, and it's literally like George's head, but it has a hand coming out of it, and it's pulling his face. 
So Brian saw that and said, I want to do that. And George was like, okay. <laughs> so really, all of that came from George. All of that craziness came from George's mind on how we were going to do that. So the script was completely rewritten to that. That is so cool. <laughs> Sweet. Thank you. Hey again. Hey again. How you doing? Nope, not bad, you? I'm good. Uh, yeah, I guess my main question was uh, for aspiring creature creators. Uh, there are probably a lot of people that want to do like hand, like homemade versions of things like this. Do you have any tips or tricks or stories that are relevant to people that might want to be doing this on a smaller scale? I'll be honest, just if it's something you're passionate about, just do it. Practice, sculpt, take life casts, do it all. Okay. Um, experiment. You know, um, that's how, like today, like there's so many more tools available, but it's because of guys like myself and, and guys that I worked with that the tools are there now because we had to figure out how to do those things with nothing. And, you know, I mean, we use things like food thickeners and trash bags and, you know, I mean, it was just like, how do we trick the camera? So now you have so many more materials available to you. Um, and it's, it's so much easier, actually, to become very good. I mean, so I've met so many people. If you're an aspiring artist, like many I've met, they far exceed my, my skills. And it's because we have those tools. So if it's something you're passionate about, never give it up. Don't give it up. Just keep practicing, keep doing, until you feel comfortable with what you're doing. I mean, any time I throw out trash, I look at something and say, that looks like a monster. So I'm like, why am I throwing this out and not making it horrible? Well, I'll, I'll tell you one, one thing I find, and, and this is definitely true of most artists. Um, I think we are our own worst enemies, so to speak, because we see every flaw. Um, I see every flaw in everything I do, and you know, I, it's taken a lot of friends and a lot, including my wife, that that look at something and go, "How how do you even see that?" You know, some little tiny flaw in it, but I see everything. I spend hours looking at it, so I know where every problem is, and. I think that sometimes you have to forgive yourself a little bit and give yourself a little leeway, step back from it for a little time, whatever it takes. But it, truly, if it's something you love, don't let anybody tell you you can't do it, because you can. Great, thank you.